Dr. Mindy here, and on this video, I'm gonna show you the six worst foods you can eat if you're trying to lose weight. Okay, ready? Six foods. I've broken them down. I'm gonna move over this way. I've broken them down into three categories and I put them in the exact order I want you to start to peck away at and to avoid, okay? So the first one, these are the musts. There is no ands, ifs, or buts about these. You have got to get these foods out of your diet like today. So the first one are bad oils. These are your canola, your corn, your cottonseed, your soybean, your partially hydrogenated, your vegetable oils, safflower, sunflower oils. I've done videos on these oils, but these inflammatory oils you've got to get out. Okay, second thing is the refined flours. These are man-made, these refined flours. So they are, even if they're gluten-free, this is your cakes, your cookies, your pastas, your breads, your tortillas, all of that refined flours typically will spike your blood sugar. And those are the ones you absolutely want to get rid of because if your blood sugar goes up, your body's not burning fat. So if you wanna lose weight, the name of the game is to bring your blood sugar down. The third must is any toxic ingredient. So this is your artificial colorings. This is your monosodium glutamate. This is your nitrites, your sodium nitrites, your red dyes. When you look at an ingredient label, if you cannot pronounce the word, it is an artificial ingredient. It was made by man and it will slow down your weight loss results. The one artificial ingredient that really trips up dieters is NutraSweet. So NutraSweet is an artificial ingredient. It was made by man. There's no NutraSweet trees as far as I know. And it will absolutely make you more hungry and more insulin resistant. So avoid those. If you haven't, by the way, if, you, if you're like, whoa, psh, I have, that's a lot right there, don't listen to the rest of this video. But if you have done that, let's move to the next step. The next one is what I call highly suggested, which means if you and I are standing at line at the grocery store and you say, how do I lose weight? I would tell you the three I just said, and then I would tell you these three. So, and what's interesting about these three is they're drinks. And this trips up fasters a lot because we don't tend to think of drinks as being something that's gonna pull us out of a fasted state. So alcohol, Okay, here's the deal with alcohol. Even you guys know I'm a fan of dry farm wines, even dry farm wines, if you're trying to lose weight. As long as alcohol is in your body, your liver is not burning fat. It is, if you are struggling to lose weight, you cannot drink and burn fat at the same time. Bottom line. So you are gonna wanna make sure to avoid alcohol. Juices. I used to be a big juicer. I have like juicers in my kitchen still that I rarely use anymore because many times juice has too much sugar in it. We lean too much into the fruits in juices. So uh, there's this misconception that orange juice is a health food. It is not a health food. Orange juice is a sugar bomb. It's as bad as a Coke to your weight loss efforts and to your metabolic, overall metabolic health. So, but even green juice, when we look at green juices, I know for me, when I go to a, a restaurant or I go to like a cafe to order a juice, I always will get a green juice without any fruit in it. It'll be all vegetables, not as tasty, I realize. The reason I do that is I don't want my blood sugar to spike. So get, if you wanna lose weight, get all juices out. I would even get coconut water out and make sure the alcohol goes out. Okay, last drink that I highly recommend you avoid are the soda and the diet sodas. So you can't, you can't drink Coke and lose weight, sorry. And you, you may find you can't drink diet Coke and lose weight because of the NutraSweet effect, where NutraSweet is causing insulin resistant, resistance and it stimulates the flipping hunger hormone in your brain. 
So you drink a Diet Coke, a Diet Pepsi, whatever, you know, eat anything with NutraSweet in it. You think you're doing a great job. You're in your 15 hour fasting window. And all of a sudden, an hour later, you're hungry. Your body's in insulin resistance. You do this day after day, and you're gonna start to get really frustrated with your fasting lifestyle. And you're gonna think fasting doesn't work for you. Fasting works for everybody. But when you start to put a diet soda into your fasting window, it, may not, it might not work for you anymore. Okay, that's the highly suggested. Now let's go to possibly, yeah, you might want to think about these, these, these two foods because they may be slowing down your weight loss efforts. The first one is fruits. Now here's the tricky part about fruits is that not all fruits are made equal. Tropical fruits, we love them for building progesterone. We don't love them for weight loss. They are highest on the glycemic index. Berries, berries are the lowest on the glycemic index. So I often, when I'm working with somebody, I often will make sure that if they have a sugar craving, if they are doing fruits, that we just come all the way down to the berries and we start to limit it to berries and maybe even green apples because those are lower on the glycemic index. But if you're one of those people where you're like, I'm doing everything, I'm not losing weight, it may be time to get rid of the fruits. Okay, second thing, the starchier, starchier carbs. I just found my own typo here. Start to your carbs. So these are your potatoes, your squashes, your beans, your quinoa. Um, those are gonna be starcher. And yes, they're progesterone building. So those of you that have been following me for a while I might be confused right now. But they, the reason that we use these carbs the week before our period for women is because we are actually made that week to bring our glucose up. But the other three weeks, we're not made to bring our glucose up. So we want to bring the, take those carbs out. So as long as it's not the week before your period, then, or you're a man, then you want to make sure that you are eliminating those starchier carbs. So there you go. The three steps that I want you to take if you're trying to lose weight, you can pair these three habits with any of the six different fasts that I teach you but I wanted to bring this to you guys because I see your comments and so many of you are succeeding and then some of you are frustrated. And I wanna make sure that if you're frustrated, let's create some checklists here. Let's make sure that you're not doing these things because they may be affecting your weight loss efforts. So let's talk about healthy foods for a moment. I feel like we have lost our way with what a healthy food is. Put in the comments if you feel like that's you. We, the, the manipulation on packaging is gotten to an extreme. So on this video, I wanna talk about the five health, healthy foods that you should never eat again. And I'm gonna give you some options of what you can eat if I pick one of your favorite foods, which if I do, I'm sorry, not sorry. I really want you to thrive with your health. So the first thing, I, I like I want you all to grab this so deeply because the food industry has gotten so crafty. And just because it says natural on packaging, just because it says healthy on packaging, does not mean it's healthy. So if you go and listen to the Resetter podcast where I spoke to Vani Hari, the food babe, we dissect ingredients and she made one recommendation that there was one ingredient we absolutely need to stay away from, that we would, we would bring our toxic load down and that ingredient is natural flavors. So there's a classic example of how what potentially got put out into the culture as healthy is not really healthy. So we want to avoid those. And these foods that I'm about to talk, uh, talk to you about, they are right in that path of people buying and eating, thinking they're doing something healthy, but are metabolically damaging. Their, their system. I'm here to teach you how to be really good at metabolic flexibility, how to switch in and out of sugar burner and fat burner. When I wrote Fast Like a Girl, the majority of this book has been about this fat burning place and it introduced the concept of we need to go in and out of these two states. What we now need to talk about, this book has been out for a year. If you, if you didn't grab it, grab it. I do talk about food in here, some basic food principles, but now we need to go deeper into food. I wanna help you become a good sugar burner. And eating these healthy foods is not putting you in a good sugar burner state. And if you're not in a good sugar burner state, if this system is all messed up, when you go over into fasting, it's really hard. And it's, gonna, the lear, it's like the learning curve for your body is really big. So let's clean this system up. Number one, 
oh, I'm so happy to talk about this. And I know some of you are not going to be happy. My first healthy food I would encourage you to take out of your diet is granola. Okay, why? Let's just talk about a bunch of different problems with granola. Now, there are, there are some granolas that can be good, but I'm going to encourage you to test it on your blood sugar reader. So if you have a continuous glucose monitor, please test it. So uh, one of the challenges is we add, you know, the, tr the dehydrated tropical fruits into it. It's not, just, it's not just granola. We add dried fruit into it and it spikes our blood sugar. We also have a tendency to put the bad oils mixed into those. So you wanna make sure there's no dried fruit. You wanna make sure that there's no bad oils in there. And I really, really encourage you to look at a gluten-free option. If you can find a gluten-free option without the dried fruit, without bad oils, then, then I will tell you, great, test it on your blood sugar reader. But if it has dried fruit in it, it is gonna spike your blood sugar and it is not healthy. It's a little bit like orange juice. Number two, yogurt. Oh, okay. These are like nails on a chalkboard for me. I've been, I feel like I'm finally getting to have a conversation with you all about some of these things that you're eating and you're frustrated because you're not losing weight or you're frustrated because you're not getting healthy, but you're eating these healthy things. So thank you for sitting with me in this conversation. So the, the challenge with yogurt is so, it's pasteurized. Pasteurized yogurt is dead food. So when you're eating yogurt thinking you're increasing calcium, nine out of 10 times you're not. When you're eating yogurt thinking you're bringing in a probiotic, if it's been pasteurized, there's no pro probiotic en enzymes in it. So be aware of that. Now the other problem that we have, and this is, this is now I'm speaking to you as a mom. When my kids were little, all those little gogurts that came in those plastic tubes and all the kids at, at snack time would suck on the plastic tubes and their face and their tongue would turn blue. We have turned what could have been a really good yogurt into a toxic bomb and we're giving it to our kids and we're telling them and we're thinking it's a health food. So those ones in the plastic tubes as you're feeding your kids, no, they are not a health food. The other problem that we have with yogurt is that we go low fat. So some, you know, low fat, high sugar yogurt, breakfast in the morning with some granola. We put it with granola too, right? Now you're, it's a, it's a glycemic bomb. You're increasing that glucose level and, and you're putting yourself on this journey of up, down glucose all day long and you're starting your day with it. So if you want a good, if you like yogurt and you're like, okay, well, I just, I just bummed you out. Sorry, not sorry, because I want you to be healthy first um, is that you can look at a Greek yogurt. So Greek yogurt is higher in protein, higher in fat, make sure it's organic, make sure it's unsweetened. Um, if it's pasteurized, it's still dead food. You're not getting probiotics, but at least it'll be good for your blood sugar and help stabilize your blood sugar. Okay, so that was number two. Number three is another good one. Oh, thank you. Thank you for hanging in here with me. I'm trying to, trying to help you live a healthy lifestyle and not fall into some of these marketing traps. Number three is green juice. Green juice is really tricky. Juices in general are really tricky. Now, I love green juice, and I'm gonna tell you how I have it so that it works well for me metabolically. But any juice bar you go to, anywhere you go to get a green juice, if even if there's wonderful greens in there, like parsley and dandelion greens are so good for your liver, um, even if all of those are in there, the minute you add fruit, oftentimes they'll add an apple, you spike the blood, your blood sugar. I've, I've seen things like pineapple be in, in green juice because it tastes better. So if you can do green juice without the sweetened, added sweetener from a, a fruit, okay, we're okay. We're like metabolically, we're okay. But that's not what most of you are doing. Most of you are doing a green ju juice with an added fruit in it. Now, my second problem that I have with green juice and just juices in general is that they need to be organic. If they're not organic, you are getting juice with pesticides in it. You are getting a bottle of endocrine disruptors. So please make sure that you're always going down that organic lane. I can't tell you how many times I travel a ton. I've been in so many airports and I'll see some green juice and I'm like, oh, yay. I'm so excited. I haven't eaten all day. I can't wait for some green juice. And um, it's not organic. 
And then I have to ask myself, you know, what has what what has my pesticide load been over the last couple of days? And if I've been eating out a lot, I know my pesticide load has been high. I know when I get home, my pesticide load load goes down. Um, so I make an educated decision at that point. But make sure it's organic. Now there is one green juice that's really fun, and a lot of you already love it. And you probably did it in the morning because it became a fad. And that's celery juice. I like celery juice. It's great antioxidant. Um, I think it would be great to break a fast with. It's great if you don't add the fruits. Um, it's great for the liver. Uh, and just make sure it's organic. Another really common one is coconut water. So I love coconut water. I love it for the electrolytes. I don't love it for the glycemic index. I don't love how high it boosts my sugar. But an interesting fact about coconut water is that if you were on a tropical island and you were dehydrated, you could put in an IV of coconut water and you would get all the electrolytes you need to keep yourself hydrated. So I do like it sometimes added to a smoothie. Um, when I've done three day water fasts I've done in my life, um, I, I sometimes I'll, I'll add it into those first couple of um, things that I eat or drink the first couple of hours because I like to replenish with those with the electrolyte. If I've been on like a really long hike or a long run and I've been really dehydrated, then I will look to add, it, um, add in some coconut water to bring those electrolytes up. I really like it for adding in electrolytes. Now the best, is to get it from the coconut. So if you're in a tropical place, you know how to do that. Um, if you are in a, in a, going into a natural food store, a lot of them already have coconuts. Buy it, and that is your best source right there. Whereas the pre-made coconut waters are gonna be a little more processed, a lot more, when they're more processed, it means a higher glycemic index, and um, it's it may not have the same uh, electrolyte uh, uh, response that you're looking for. Whereas if you go straight to the source and get it from a coconut, that is your best deal. Okay, number five, and my last one, and I feel like we've talked about this a ton, but I wanna talk about how you do this in a positive way, and that's whole wheat bread. So with whole wheat bread, you know, I, I, I'm a product of the 70s and the 80s. So the way that we understood bread back then is everybody started off doing white bread. And then it was like, oh, white bread's not healthy, but whole wheat is. But then in order to match everybody's taste buds, we've been ultra refining whole wheat bread. So your traditional whole wheat bread is not healthy. In fact, there's a lot of belief that a glycemic wise, blood sugar wise, that a piece of bread will spike your blood sugar higher than a candy bar. So. It's, it, so think of it like candy. Whole wheat processed bread is like candy. But if you don't want it to be like candy, you can lean into the ancient grains. Now you'll notice I didn't say go gluten free to bring up your glyce to help with the glycemic part of this. I'm uh, I'm saying that when you do the nuttier, the, they take longer to chew. Um, when you're doing those ancient grains, then you're getting enzymes in there. You're getting nutrients in there that get that would have been processed out. You have more fiber in there, so your blood sugar doesn't raise as high. So I really, really love the ancient grains. The other thing I want to tell you, those of you that are going keto or you like low carb, is a lettuce wrap works really well. And I'll tell you my favorite thing to, is radicchio leaves. Radicchio leaves, they hold together. Um, so I do, I mean, in our house in, in general, many nights we will do a burger inside a radicchio leaf because it holds together and it's great for the liver. I'll even spread on some mayonnaise onto it. Um, and it's a really yummy treat. So if you're like, I can't get ancient grains, skip the whole wheat bread, skip the bread all, bread all together and dive into a really good vegetable like radicchio that can, can act as bread. Okay, let's talk about the foods that are damaging your brain. There's a lot of them and there are probably some of them that you love, but I just wanna to bring to your attention uh, some of these foods and talk about some alternatives and just, just so you know, because I think what happens with brain health specifically is that we get to this place where we don't feel like our brain's working as well as we'd like it to, but we don't understand why. And unfortunately, we walk into our doctor's office and our doctors aren't trained in lifestyle, nor do many doctors right now have time to sit down and educate you on lifestyle. And so we 
don't get, we don't make that correlation between what we're eating and how our brain is functioning. So what I really want to do with this video is help you think through your food choices um, and really understand if they are supporting good brain health or not. Um, and, and then you make a smart decision for you. The, I think the first place to ask yourself is what fuel sources does your brain require? Like what is your, what does your brain need? And I, I really break it down into the three macronutrients, which is it needs protein because it needs to be able to have amino acids. Amino acids are really, really important for neurotransmitter production and hormone production. And remember, you got a lot of neurotransmitters in your brain like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA. These are neurotransmitters that make you feel really good. And for my menopausal women, I really want to point out, make sure that you that you understand this, that um, when estradiol and progesterone go away through the perimenopause, and menopause process. They were precursors for dopamine, serotonin, uh, acetylcholine, oxytocin, BDNF, which helps is a brain fertilizer for neuroplasticity. Um, and so you are really at a, at a neurochemical deficit. And if you're not eating enough protein as you're going through your menopausal experience or even post-menopausal, you're not getting a complete array of amino acids, then what is ending up happening is that you might not have the precursor that you need to make all these hormones. So think about this. It could be as simple if you're like 48 years old and you're depressed, you know, are you having enough poultry so that you can get tryptophan, which is a precursor to make serotonin. Like, are you, is that happening? Instead, if we're 48 years old and we're depressed, we think that maybe we didn't have our hormones dialed in, or we think that maybe we need to get on an antidepressant. Like we, we start to think it's something like that, but let's go back to the basics. Maybe you need more protein because it has this amino acid profile that is so supportive of the brain. Okay, second fuel source the brain requires is good fats. So good fats, not bad fats. Bad fats inflame your brain. Now I know for whatever reason, there is like massive controversy over things like seed oils. Um, again, it's always how these oils are processed. So the more quicker that they are processed and made like canola oil and cottonseed oil and corn oil and um, vegetable oil, soybean oil, partially hydrogenated oils, those oils tend to be made very, very quickly, they're broken down. There's not a lot of nutrients in it. When we eat them, they're inflammatory. And that means they can also inflame the brain. So what we want to do is we want to think about how do we add more good oils in? So this is your avocados. Um, these are your flaxseed. This is your MCT, your avocado oil. This is your olive oil. These are all great oils to help nourish the brain. The third is carbohydrates. Your, your brain needs carbohydrates. So this is where the keto diet really got off course for people is that it was so focused on low carb. People were like, okay, out with the vegetables, out with anything. They were just eating meat um, and some fat and they were losing weight and doing really well, but they forgot about their whole neurochemical system and how they needed to get more carbs so that they could be able um, to make some of these neurotransmitters. Okay. So with that in mind, that's the requirements of the brain. Those three things. Oh, the other thing the brain loves ketones. So everything I just told you is that is supporting 50% of the fuel source for your brain. And the other 50% is ketones. So if you're not fasting, think about this for a moment. If you're not fasting, making ketones, you're not eating enough protein, you're not eating good oils, bad oils, and you're not eating enough of the of nature's carbs, you're gonna be at a brain deficit. So let's change that. First is the refined sugars. There's no nutritional value in sugar, it tastes good, but when it what's happening is it's creating this dopamine spike. And the dopamine spike, well, as long as dopamine's going up and down, dopamine is the molecule of more. It's not the molecule of enough. So every time you get a dopamine spike, then your brain goes, I want more of that. And then it just, it's just keeps leading you down a path of more, which is why refined sugars are so addictive. But here's a little trick. 
that you can do. What if you have your refined sugar with some really good healthy fat? Then the fat would go up into the brain and turn off the hunger hormone if it was a good healthy fat and it would slow your blood sugar down so you're not getting a drop in your blood sugar after you eat that sugar. So sometimes there's different ways we can dress up, like something like a refined sugar. Sometimes there's ways we can dress up some of these bad things and make them a little bit better. Not completely good, but a little bit better. Okay, number two, thing I want you to avoid, worst food for your brain, are the refined flours. Now, same reason, when they think about this, I'm really a fan, if you're gonna do a grain, do an ancient grain. Because an ancient grain has enzymes in it, it's sprouted, it has um, some, if you do like a sourdough, it's fermented, it has some good probiotics in it. Um, there's nutrients there. But when I walk into my grocery store and I look at some bread and all of a sudden I just buy the, the bread that was the, my bread I've been eating since childhood, let's say, um, what we know is that if it's been highly refined, A, the actual process of making that refined flour took all the nutrients out. So there's, it's nutrient dead. Think about that for a moment. Like literally your sandwich you're eating or the bread you're having in the morning that's like that traditional refined flour, it has no nu nutrients in it. It's not gonna do anything for your brain. So could we switch over to the sprouted grains? Could we switch to the sourdough like I recommended? But the highly processed refined flours are not good for your brain. Okay, number three are the bad oils. So I already talked about good oils versus bad oils, but um, you know, think about like an ankle sprain. When you sprain your ankle, you can't really walk on it very well and it swells up. Your brain is literally swelling every time you're eating bad oils. It's like, and how could you think right? The brain's job is to coordinate everything in the body. It's to give you great mental clarity, but you're not gonna think right if you're eating these inflammatory oils. And unfortunately, you know, every time you go out to eat, you're gonna get exposed to these inflammatory oils, um, which causing your brain to swell and for you not to focus and to struggle. So that's not good. Um, so we gotta get the inflammatory oils out. And, and you've, if you've followed me at all, hopefully you know that's like one of the number one ingredient changes that I really recommend we all change. Okay, check this out. I have a free fasting guide for you all. It's free and it's gonna teach you all the basics of fasting. It's gonna teach you how to kill hunger when you fast, which is really cool. And it's gonna show you how to break your fast among many other things. All you gotta do is click on this link right here and enjoy. Okay, and then the last one that I really, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say it, um, is alcohol. So alcohol is a neurotoxin. I know there's a big movement at post pandemic for everybody to get off alcohol. I'm not saying completely stay away from it, but I really encourage you to bring it down because it is, it's a, it's a toxin to the brain and it, it affects blood flow to the brain. And when you're not getting a lot of blood flow to the brain, you're also, you know, threatening brain cells. So just making sure that you're keeping it in moderation. It, the, the upside of alcohol is that it can relax you. And so it can bring cortisol down. And if it brings cortisol down, cortisol is damaging to the brain as well. So this is why I like a more moderate approach of like, let's just be aware. Uh, I love good wine, fermented. Uh, and you know, red wine has some, some good uh, antioxidants in it, like Veritrol, uh, but in moderation. And I, and I do agree with, this, with the research that's showing that women need to drink less than men because it does affect how our hormones are broken down. And um, I, I also agree that there's a time and a place. Just be aware of the effects long-term on your brain. But when it comes to electrolytes, what are we talking about? Are we talking about putting like a little bit of salt in your water? Yeah. Or or do you use like a, you know, one of, I, I'm, a, I'm personally a huge fan of, of element. Yeah, I use too. element all the time. Um, but is that it, like, is it something like that? I mean, element yeah. also has like flavors in most of their, you know, in, in most of their uh, varieties. So it's like, yeah, what are we specifically talking yeah, about? Yeah, element elements a, is a big one. So what let's break it down. What's in element is magnesium, pot uh, potassium and sodium. So those are things, those are nutrients you need in a fasted state. Hmm. And actually Rob developed element for fasters. Oh, interesting. It was originally developed for fasters, wow. which is really interesting because we use it for a lot of other things. Hmm. Also, do you know that his mango, chili, and lemon habanero was meant to be a mixer? <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. I, I figured this out because... All of a sudden, my college age kids started taking all my element, <laughs> and I was like, "What are they? What are they doing?" And then I realized, "Oh, they're using it for like a hangover." 
And then I, s- I brought it to Rob and he's like, oh yeah, we made, that's why we made those two was f- as a mixer for wow. Drake's. That checks out. That's that funny? funny. I actually, I love to use Element. I feel like if, uh, if I feel sometimes, um, even the most subtle onset of a, uh, of a migraine, which I don't get mm. very frequently, especially not anymore, but, um, but you know, I occasionally will get them. Element really does help yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at just potassium, potassium is needed by the brain, it's needed by the muscles. Um, and magnesium is needed. I mean, it's, it, it, it is arguably the most important nutrient that we can get in our body, both men and women, uh, not only for hormone production, but for brain health, muscle production. So that would make perfect sense. Um, sodium is interesting. And I know you have some thoughts on, on sodium, but one of the things that I really wrestled with when I looked at Element as a, as a resource for my community in this fasted state was like, well, what do we do with the people with high blood pressure? You know, if sodium causes high blood pressure, which, I, you know, there's a lot of speculation that that's not even accurate. But the best way to address the sodium issue is to bring it in when insulin is low. Hmm. So again, we're back at the, a nuanced conversation that's not happening. So if you're concerned about the sodium in it, but you're putting it into your fasting window, that concern, all the studies that were ever done or ever shown that sodium created high blood pressure, which sugar does it even more, were done in the presence of high insulin, high glucose. But with fasting, what we're doing is we're regulating that system and we're putting you in a glucose deficit and you're, we're bringing down insulin. When we bring sodium in, now you can actually see the magic of how sodium is supposed to work. Hmm. Yeah, because as far as I know, insulin tells the – insulin, which is elevate – you depress insulin essentially when you're fasted and insulin holds, causes the body to hold on to sodium. That's right. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So when you're in a fasted state, your ba- your body's just not very efficient at holding on to sodium. No. So you, you hypothetically, I guess you would have a, a, a higher tolerance for it. That's right. Before you would see any impact on, yeah. on blood pressure. And your cells will use it differently. Hmm. In the presence of insulin, it's going to block that sodium out from the cells. But in when insulin's low, now the cell can, it's a necessary, necessary nutrient. It's a, an incredibly important nutrient, specifically for muscles and like relaxing muscles, which, you know, if we look at the migraine, it's not only blood flow to the brain, but it can be like, you know, tight muscles that have caused a, that blood flow to be restricted. Yeah. Migraines are super complex. They are. Yeah. They are very complex. Um, I've been on my own like migraine journey mm. for the past year. It was uh, about a year ago. Yeah. About a year ago that I was like, diagnose you know i i would get occasional headaches Mm -hmm. but it took me um yeah i guess like 39 years to figure out that those headaches that i was occasionally getting were called migraines yeah do you get or do you get like the ocular whole experience uh no i don't get the i don't get like aura or anything like that yeah um but it is like typically on one side towards the front of my of my head and it's it's uh, it's difficult. I guess with with migraines, it really does help to do to like journal about them to see mm. what the various triggers are because they could be different for everybody. Totally you know, there's like yeah. for some dark chocolate, red wine. I could drink red wine and not have any migraine. You know, yeah. like it, it's like you're lucky. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not the most predictable thing for me. I mean, I think like sleep is involved, mm. but like it's the kind of thing where I will wake up. I can almost. I can actually almost feel its onset before I go to sleep Mm -hmm. and then I wake up, I have a migraine and it lasts all day for the most part until either I exercise. A lot of the time I can just exercise and it goes Mm -hmm. away. Although sometimes I get like, I'll feel like the, the, the onset of like an exertion headache depending on the exercise. But usually that doesn't turn into a full blown migraine. But so yeah, usually I'll have a migraine until I exercise or go to sleep. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, like, so it, 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 oftentimes will last like 24 hours. And then occasionally I get them from flying. Flying headaches are a real thing. Yeah. The pressure, you know. So what's interesting about migraines is there's two phases that are completely different to it. So the first phase can actually be the constriction of blood flow. And that's where you start to feel like it's coming on. But that can be followed by actually the blood vessels opening up and you get a flood of blood flow. Mm. So it's sometimes catching it at that moment. If you can find the trick to catch it before it goes into a full migraine is, Mm. is really critical. So our, our son gets ocular migraines a lot and we've played with this so much where I'm like, okay, cause, cause with an ocular migraine, you actually will go like, you can't see, you like go blind. And so he can't do anything except lie down wow. until until it goes away. 
And so we've played with that critical transition moment. And this is where something like like Element would is has really helped. We've also put him in hyperbaric. Yeah, Element Element does help me. And I know that I have a I have a commercial affiliation with them, but I'm being totally honest. I, you know, will have it when I'm especially when I'm traveling, because I know one occasional trigger for me is flying. Yeah. Element definitely helps. And I I'm not just saying that. Like it does it does, yeah, you know, I it's agree. it's the it's the electrolytes and um, yeah, I feel like it, it definitely, um, provides a, a therapeutic effect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. agree. I actually, I've never shared this on the podcast, but I, um, a year ago. So what began my migraine journey, I developed Horner syndrome. Are you oh, familiar yeah. with Horner's? Years ago. I, uh, yeah. I learned yeah. about it. Tell me more of how it expressed for well, you. Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I haven't showed, sh- Sharon shared photos of this or anything like that, but um, I flew to Austin. It was like a year ago. It was like January of 2022. Mm. And, um, the day of my flight, cause I told you like my flying is, is associated with migraine for me. I didn't have a migraine, mm. um, during the flight, but that night I was at dinner and my right eyelid yeah. basically sunk to half mast. And I called up a friend of mine, a neurologist, and he was like, you should go to the emergency room. And while I was on the phone with him, it resolved itself. It was super weird. I had like my eyelid was like at half mast and then within 20 minutes it went back to it went back to normal. But then four days later when I was flying back to L.A. from Austin mid flight, it happened again and it didn't resolve for about two months. My, I mean, it's wow. it slowly got better. But Horner syndrome, the triad of, of symptoms classically associated with Horner syndrome is ptosis meiosis and anhydrosis mm. which is like an inability to sweat on that side yeah. of the on that side of the face it's all ipsilateral like on that on that side the pupil is affected the eyelid is affected and those two months i was actually behind the scenes unbeknownst to nobody but like my family and my immediate friends i was going to like i was in the emergency room a few times i was like to, to rule out these really bad things that could otherwise cause horn right like the yeah. first, it's a it's a diagnosis by you know exclusion like mm. you want to make sure that you don't have like a brain tumor i was just gonna say your brain you probably went to brain tumor first yeah, yeah i got yeah. i got my head scanned i got um made sure that i had no carotid dissection which can occur uh with like you know neck manipulation um, what was the other thing? A mass in the lung. So we had to rule out all these freaking things. Mm. And then the best case scenario was that it would be uh, that it, that it can sometimes be associated with migraine, which it turns mm. out that's what it was for me, you know? Interesting. And I still technically have it, but, um, but the symptoms have completely gone, have gone away. Yeah. So I can test it by putting apoclonidine drops in my eyes. Mm. It makes the pupil dilate. But, um, but yeah, super, Crazy. super weird. It's scary. You probably, that's probably scary. I was to pretty have... scared. Yeah, yeah. I was at, at first I was scared. I was yeah. like, I, I have a brain tumor. I'm, you know, yeah. this is it for me. But, um, but we ruled out all those things. I had a great like medical team that was, that that's was awesome. like supporting me. And you can actually go to my Instagram. There's like, uh, you know, back January, February of 2018. Some of the things are posted like out of temporal context that I post on my Instagram, but generally there's like a few clips where you can actually like kind of see that my eyelid was like not functioning properly. Yeah. Very weird. And I still, and I still technically like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't go, go away to my knowledge. So yeah. Wow. Super scary. Yeah. It's crazy. You just, I mean, we're so complex. We are so complex. And you know, what I was thinking is, is that we, we give these fancy labels to these really complex conditions that happen our, in our body. And we have a little bit of like, okay, we got, we labeled it. We're good. But yet how each person handles the treatment of that label has to be unique. And I think that this is something that's starting to approach or, or be talked about a lot more in healthcare is that we've gone from a one size fits all to personalized approach. Yet that leaves a lot of responsibility on the individual to figure out what the personalized approach is to their healthcare, uh, you know, challenge. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like this is, so, I call it the wild, wild west. We're a little bit in this wild, wild west moment where people are saying, okay, don't give me a diagnosis and the same solution you give everybody. I can go to the internet and I can actually, I can interview, you know, I can find all the things I need to find about how to handle my solution. But now I'm stuck with, shit, I got to put my own health puzzle together. And that's where things start to fall apart, I believe, right now. 
Definitely. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're in the midst of a potential health crisis, it's like, you know, you are thrust into that fight or flight, hyper vigilant state where, you know, thinking like creatively about solutions, it's, it just becomes like, all you want is like to like, you know, you're just in that hyper vigilant state and it's, it's just hard to th really think about, about think re like rationally. That's right. Like a rational human being yeah. in those moments. Yeah. Right. You become like a frightened animal. Right. Yeah. And well, okay. So then let's, let's talk about that. You, you're, you have all this information, you have all these symptoms, you don't know the door out. And what's now happened is you're getting locked into the part of your brain. That's the fight or flight brain, the amygdala. And so your, your problem solving abilities go way down. Yeah. So if you're locked in your amygdala, you're not operating from your prefrontal cortex. And so you got even another problem now. And, and that, that is our healthcare system and why things we have to start to be more preventative. We have to start creating new formulas. We have to get out of looking at like, if I have a symptom, I have a problem. And if I don't have a symptom, I must be healthy. We, we gotta, I believe we gotta change the whole paradigm for both men and women because what we have done is completely broken, hmm. especially for chronic conditions. Now, if, if I lose an arm in an accident, take me to the emergency room, what they're doing there is amazing. But if I all of a sudden, you know, can't get pregnant or I have a situation, I have migraines that won't go away, now we've got, we don't have a good formula in place for people to step into and solve their own health problems. Yeah. So what is the path forward? Self-education? I, well, I think it's twofold. First, and, and, and please, you know, as people are listening to this, take this with love, but your health is your responsibility. End of story. So if you don't love the body you're living in, change that. And that's going to be you researching what's right for you. So you can't sit back like you're, you're a great example. When you had Horner syndrome, you could have sat back and been like, oh, well, that was, thank God that's over. You said I created a team of people around me to help support me. That, so we take responsibility, we gather information, we get a team of doctors, health practitioners that support us. And then there's a little bit of trial and error. I'm sure you did this with Horner syndrome and with your migraines. Like, let me try this and see how this works. Okay, yeah, that worked. Okay, now let me add another layer to that. So, but we none of that can happen if we don't take responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Today, I mean, we live in a time where there's so much victim mindset. So much. You know, it's a it's a it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. There but was that woman re recently on a highly credentialed medical doctor from, uh, I believe, Stan Harvard, who, you know, made the claim that, gene that that the primary cause of obesity is genetics. And so, I mean, that something like that just f continues to foment this, like, woe is me, yeah. like, I'm so unlucky with the cards that I've been dealt. I mean, yeah, we, d we discussed, like, equity, you know, and, and, and inequality, that all exists. But at a certain point, you have to take your own life by the reins. That's right. That's right. Um, I think that we're coming out of this broken healthcare system. People are waking up to that. A new model has not emerged yet. So discussions like this, I hope, will deepen the way that people think of this. But when we look at the old model, like even like my parents' age, you know, my parents are in their 80s. If I look at what they were used to, they had a problem, they went to the doctor, the almighty doctor told them what the problem was, gave it a fancy name, gave them a pill, they walked away with the pill. If the pill doesn't work, they weren't like, oh, well, maybe there's something else I can do. They went back and went to the doctor and like, this pill doesn't work, it's the pill's responsibility. They do that enough times where the pill doesn't work and eventually it's the doctor's problem. So we have been trained in a system that has told us it's either uh, there's another solution outside of us. Mm. So to give us all a little more compassion and, and credibility, I want people to understand that is broken. That has to end for both men and women, but especially for women. Okay, so once we step into personal responsibility, there is, you stop looking for absolutes. So diet's a great example. Let's stop saying, hey, the vegan diet's the best. Plant-based people are amazing and carnivore people are ruining the planet. No, there's no absolutes. We have to start to play with the different principles and the different pieces and then find our natural rhythm. That's going to take some time for humans to grab onto because we have been conditioned otherwise. 
at another perfect example of this is how many of us have been conditioned that happiness comes from outside. You mm. know, if I have the right car, if I write, have the right house, I'll be happy. And how many of us have hit that point and had a surge of happiness only to find that our troubles have followed us there? So at, when we go for exogenous stimulation, when we put give our power outside of us, that's when we mentally and physically start to crumble. But the minute we go inside and we understand ourselves, think conversations like this, we understand what our body wants, our unique body, now we're, we have a path into ending both mental and physical disease. Absolutely. So well said. And circling back to fasting, you think that, do, do you think that fasting can help facilitate, I mean, in a way, as a microcosm, like a greater awareness for that in life, which can fulfill us? Oh, a thousand percent. So this is, again, why I'm so excited about fasting is it hits every single tool we need right now. So for starters, you're going to do it. I can sit here and I can tell you how to do it, but I'm not doing it for you. Just, the pill is, is doing something for you. You're actually, when you fast, you're stepping out of your educated brain and you're saying, okay, body, I get that you're really intelligent and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go to work. So we, we start to get to know ourselves differently. Then when we look at things like big food and big pharma and all the toxic pieces that we have, we're avoiding that. Then when we start to look at, you know, even with diets, we can be like the diet or my trainer or my therapist, they were all the ones that healed me. No, nope, not with fasting. Mm. With fasting, you heal yourself. And then we add on top of that, the spiritual insight, the mental changes, the neurochemical changes. I just don't know a tool that can hit every single one of those markers, except maybe a hug. So if you love this video, you're gonna wanna check out this video. Foods that I used to eat, seven of them. I used to eat them all the time. Some of them are gonna shock you and I don't eat them anymore. Now, let me tell you where you might find conventional fruit. So apples and bananas are kind of the biggies. The apple a day kept the doctor away. Mm, not anymore. 